We need a new system. We need a new society. We need to demand that which may have sounded impossible even a few weeks ago, but is not only realizable, but an imperative necessity. Twenty-one years ago, the United States suffered the September 11, 2001 attacks. Shortly thereafter, U.S. foreign and military policy was reoriented. The U.S. went to war in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Libya, fought proxy wars elsewhere. Welcome to this week's episode of The Socialist Program. I'm your host, Brian Becker. Today, we're talking with Vijay Prashad. Vijay is the executive director of the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. He's the chief editor of Leftward Books. He is a prolific author, and he just published a new book with Noam Chomsky called The Withdrawal, Iraq, Libya, Afghanistan, and the Fragility of U.S. Power. That's what we'll discuss today. Vijay Prashad, welcome back to The Socialist Program. Thanks a lot, Brian. It's great to be with you. Well, I got a chance in preparation for this interview to read the book, The Withdrawal, uh, and I was excited about the book. I found it to be educational, informative, even for those of us who think we know those stories. We know the stories of endless U.S. wars, not just Iraq and not just Afghanistan and Libya, but going back to Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia. Uh, when you read this book, you'll if you if you once knew most of this material, you'll be refreshed. If you haven't uh, read this material, I consider this a must read. And the fact that it's based on a conversation or a series of conversations between you and the very famous linguist professor from MIT, social commenta commentator, historian Noam Chomsky, makes it an even more delightful read. And Noam Chomsky has such vast uh, knowledge, has paid careful attention to the minutia, not just the, the foreign policy of the United States in big strokes, but the minutia of U.S. foreign policy, and your own scholarship, your own journalism. I mean, this combination of individuals coming together to have conversations on these big topics, I think it was ju it's just a remarkable contribution to contemporary progressive literature. Uh, before we start with the content itself, the withdrawal, just talk, if you would, about your own relationship with Noam Chomsky and how this project came to be. First, Brian, you know, everything you've said has really touched me a lot, and I'm very grateful to you for saying all that. Um, when I was a young journalist in India, I was writing just around the time of the fall of the Soviet Union, I was writing about changing labor patterns in a... Um, oppressed caste neighborhood in Delhi. And for some reason, I wrote a letter to Noam Chomsky. I typed it out and I put it in an envelope and I mailed it to his office at MIT. Um, I, I don't know why I felt the need to tell him about what I had found, but I did it and it went to him. And I was extremely surprised to receive a typed letter back from him where he engaged with what I was saying and he offered some suggestions and he made some connections and so on. Since then, since roughly 1993, um, we've corresponded increasingly uh, about a range of issues. About four or five years later, I was interested in traveling to the Middle East to write about the wars there in Turkey and so on. Again, Chomsky wrote to me and I'll never forget that he, at each, each time he expressed concern for my well-being. You're going to go to the Kurdish areas of Turkey. Be careful. These are the things that can happen. I found him to be an extraordinarily um, kind and generous man. During the time of the pandemic, it became clear to me that the United States was going to have to leave Afghanistan. It, it was just clear, not just to me, but U.S. intelligence reports were making it clear that three quarters of Afghanistan was really not in the control of the US-backed government in Kabul, the government of President Ashraf Ghani. So I called Noam at this time. He was under a severe lockdown in Arizona. And I said to him, look, let's try to put together a book 
for young people mainly who didn't grow up in the shadow of these wars to explain to them in as plain a way as possible uh, about how the united states got into these wars what these wars mean and how the us was forced to extricate from these wars at the same time i was quite eager because i know norm and i shared an opinion on this that we put out there some kind of record brian we don't really believe in the view that the united states is eternally going to be the most powerful country that's one view a lot of sort of atlantic council people council of foreign relations people write books like that a new american century and so on and there was a second view which i also disagree with which is the kind of declinist end of the united states the fall of the us that school of thought which i think is sometimes um it's just too eager to see the end of the us empire but doesn't get guided by the facts i i feel that we are somewhere in the middle and i know chomsky and i agreed about this so i thought let's assess the range of these wars but also put our finger in the middle of this debate and you know then we came up with the idea that american power us power is fragile it is neither eternal nor has it declined but it is in a position of great fragility some areas it remains extraordinarily uh, powerful in terms of information and and communications you know the ideological battles in terms of military power remains so we wanted to have a sort of easy book to read for young people in particular tell them about the contemporary history but also enter this debate you know not in a very academic way but in a marginal way yeah indeed and and i think that's one of the great contributions and one of the things i want to really for those listening or watching our show to uh, to understand about this book if you don't feel that you are a historian if you are you know born in the last 20 years if you didn't experience vietnam or laos or if you were too young actually to remember september 11th this book brings you right into all of those primary conversations with very very knowledgeable people but it's so accessible and it seems to me that that's the whole idea we're in you know uh, vj you and i were recently at a meeting in brazil hosted by the mst the the landless peasants movement the rural workers movement in brazil and there was a lot of talk at that meeting about the battle of ideas meaning that if you're going to change the system or if you believe that people make history and that the people will change the system the people have several obstacles one is the repressive power of the state uh the military etc cetera, etc cetera. that we're kind of aware of that's very dramatic but there's a less dramatic but perhaps more potent uh obstacle that a uh, revolutionary or radical change is up against and that is that the dominant ideas of society are the ideas of its ruling class as karl marx said so we who believe in change fighting for change care about change and that's why we do this show we're not doing this show because it's interesting even though we hope it is we want to make change and so the battle of ideas is first and foremost and and that's what makes this book really really important i wish every high school sort of junior year social studies uh class or history class could be reading this book as a matter of fact i'd like to do a campaign demanding that because if young people and i see by the way the curriculum of a 15 year old 16 year old and it's pretty awful about vietnam laos this is not ancient history but it's pretty awful anyway go ahead well look you know i mean i i agree with you of course and i like the idea of the campaign but i was speaking to a a reporter european reporter today before we we spoke and he said something interesting to me we were talking about this book and he said to me do you feel comfortable that in this new multipolar world two of the major countries that will help shape this world are dictatorships um he of course meant russia and china and i asked him a question you know firstly it's interesting that he would so cavalierly say that you know that these are dictatorships well um that's interesting um wh- what does he mean by that it, it is a settled opinion that he is giving me um you know where i'm supposed to in some sort of liberal conversation say yes i'm very worried about that 
But I tried to take him in a different direction. And, and here goes the battle of ideas, Brian, in a direct way. I tried to take him in a different direction. I said, look, frankly, um, China and Russia as well are major powers in the world. That's not something that you or I get to choose. You know, they are already by the dint of a historical process. We don't get to select who is a major power. That's, a, that's part of the historical process. Now, the issue is how you're going to deal with it. Let, let's not have a debate about whether it's a dictatorship or not a dictatorship. You know, uh, if you believe, I asked him, that let's say China is a dictatorship and China is already established as a major power, then that leads you, given that you've asked me this question, it leads you to want to change the government in China. That kind of question that he asked me is, in fact, regime change thinking, because he's asked me, are you comfortable with this country, which is a dictatorship, being a major leader? Well, if I say I'm not comfortable with it, then the only choice is regime change in China, because the fact is China is a major power in the world. And so I raised this with him. And it was very interesting, Brian. He he was a little stupefied, I, I feel. I don't think he understood that he was essentially articulating a regime change question. He thought he was just asking an ordinary liberal question. Mm. It raises an interesting point for people like us. In other words, what is the interesting point? That a what looks like a perfectly reasonable liberal question, perfectly harmless liberal question, is actually an extraordinarily dangerous regime change question. Because what he's effectively saying is that we need to change the regime in China, which is a powerful country, rather than the other way around, which is the point that I would uh, argue for, is that regardless of what your views are on the internal political um, relations in China, it is a major power. It is a major power that accepts the importance, uh, the, in fact, not just the importance, but the, the es essential nature of the UN um, charter and therefore, why not strengthen the UN system rather than worry about the internal relations of China? That's how I would like to argue the case. Very interesting that if you think about the battle of ideas, that ordinary liberal arguments that prevail in Western Europe, in the United States, in Canada and so on, actually have within them uh, basically a kind of regime changist ideology, which is what to some extent, extent explains um, the, is, you know, the kind of, of uh, large consensus that prevails across the Atlantic about carrying out these sort of messianic wars, whether it was the war against uh, Iraq in the 90s or the war against Afghanistan or the war in Libya. These were messianic wars in many ways where a kind of liberal messianism prevailed, trying to shape the world in the image of a fantasy um, you know, that was held, say, in the Beltway or in Cambridge University and so on. Uh, but you see, what appears as an ordinary, harmless liberal statement ends up destroying countries, uh, ends up bringing the world to catastrophe. And I think just raising these questions, Brian, was it was so interesting to see the, the journalist be a little stupefied, a little perplexed that he had entered into an arena thinking he was just asking a decent liberal question, when in fact, essentially, he was closer to Donald Rumsfeld and people like that, Dick Cheney, than he is closer to, you know, people like us who are basically peacemongers. Well, speaking of Donald Rumsfeld, in one of the early parts of the book, your book with Noam Chomsky, uh, you talk about how Donald Rumsfeld reacted to September 11th. And there was a note taker or a, a person in a internal meeting with Donald Rumsfeld that afternoon, the afternoon of September 11th. They were in the Pentagon, of course. The Pentagon was also struck. I was here in New York City, actually not too far from the World Trade Center. Uh, so New Yorkers were thinking World Trade Center that dominated Manhattan. But there was the other attack, which was on the Pentagon. So you would think, well, they must be tending to the wounded and worried about another attack. But in that few hours afterwards, Donald Rumsfeld sits with some staff and his thoughts are not about imminent new attacks on the building. His thoughts are, how can we use this? 
This is a unique and wonderful opportunity. That's what he's basically suggesting. And the note taker, you include the notes in this important chapter. He's like, now we have it. We have a rare opportunity. And that was for regime change. And when you look at the countries that are then targeted, then demonized, labeled as either a dictatorship or harboring terrorists or having weapons of mass uh, destruction, whatever they are, but they're all dictatorships, of course, as you said. And there was a, an assumption because the demonization is so complete that even liberals who would presumably be anti-war sort of assumed the basic assumption about in, in the demonization campaign. But it was all premised, as Rumsfeld clearly stated in the hours after September 11th, on a new foreign policy. And the governments that are targeted are not Saudi Arabia. They're not dictatorships in Latin America. They're not the state of Israel in spite of its occupation policies. These are governments that are in resource rich parts of the world that have their origin. Whether you like the governments or not, they have their origins in the anti-colonial project of the post-World War II. And yet, even though Rumsfeld, and this is what makes this so important for the book, he's sort of telling the truth about what's coming. But liberals, and I don't mean to just castigate liberals, I, people in society whose, whose opinions are being shaped by the ruling class in society adopt all of the assumptions of the demonizers, not realizing, as you said, because they have an innocence about them or a seeming innocence, not realizing that their formulations, their narrative is actually part of a larger uh, sort of public relations campaign by people who intend to go to war. You know, it's it's really interesting, Brian, and, and this is something I've learned from Chomsky over the years. If you pay attention to U.S. documents and to the things that U.S. Um, high officials say, you learn a lot. Um, you don't really need a whistleblower. Um, you know, if you look at the strategy statements, the, the documents of the State Department, you don't even need to look at the CIA, actually. Just look at the State Department doc. You learn a lot about U.S. policy. Um, and in fact, that little chit of paper where the statement was written was later revealed uh, through freedom of information and so on. Some of it was leaked. Some of the documents of the time were leaked and so on. You got a really good picture about what was going on. And by the way, Stephen Cole's book about the lead up to the Afghanistan war is, is an extraordinary book written by a mainstream journalist who also interviews uh, high officials of the U.S. military and State Department and just gets a lot. Chomsky's greatest brilliance is that he has closely passed through the writings and speeches of the U.S. government itself to read between the lines, to put together um, their own strategy. This is from 1967 onwards. You know. It's incredible. His reading of the Pentagon Papers published as the Backroom Boys is unparalleled. So when you look closely at what the high officials of the government in the U.S. were saying from 1990, many of the same characters that are in the Bush administration, Dick Cheney and so on, um, their plans and thoughts for the post-Soviet world are extraordinary because they keep trying to put those plans into effect. Um, to make sure, for instance, that the United States remains the principal power in the world, to get rid of a series of countries that they believe are holding back uh, the possibilities of U.S. power. For instance, overthrow the revolution um, you know, in, in, uh, in Cuba. That's always been on the agenda. Uh, but then if you go to the Middle East, get rid of the uh, Islamic Republic, get rid of the government in Syria, get rid of the Iraqi government and so on, a list of governments they want to overthrow. All of that is put on the table. Um, you know, it's, not, it's totally transparent. It's written in the sheets of paper that they uh, write and then they publish as security statements and so on. Terms like in a period before 9-11, terms like rogue state are uh, invented as part of this exercise of delegitimizing entire parts of the world. If a country is a rogue state, then you don't really have to treat it with any kind of dignity, diplomatic dignity. And you don't have to worry about having a real, um, you know, a causes belay or cause of war. You can go to war because it's a rogue state. You don't really need to have a, um, you know, pretext for war. The pretext is already there in the nature of the state itself. 
North Korea, for instance, a rogue state, it already always already can be overthrown. You don't really need a pretext. It's not necessary. It helps. It helps to convince the United Nations, perhaps liberals who are not quite bought into the project and so on. But even the way you term the state as a rogue state, as an axis of evil and so on, this act of delegitimizing entire parts of the world, incredible. What it allows, Brian, and this is a key part of the book, is it allows the United States both to ignore uh, entreaties of peace from Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, countries which said, look, we want to cut a deal. We don't want a war. You can ignore that as the United States does. And we show that Saddam Hussein in 1990, just weeks after the invasion of Kuwait, comes and says, I want a deal with you. The Afghans want a deal. The Libyans want a deal. Not only does the U.S. refuse the deal, but in, there's a kind of fog of amnesia that sets in. And people just don't remember that Saddam in 1990 asked for two deals. Very interesting, Brian. We highlight this. And there's a reason we highlight it. Because I think this is forgotten by even people who, as you said, have kept up with the histories of these wars. It's utterly forgotten that Saddam twice asked for a peace deal um, in 1990. It's entirely forgotten that the New York Times and Washington Post refused to report on the Iraqi um, you know, attempt to get a peace deal. And the only reason we know about it is that that deal was somehow leaked to a reporter from Newsday, a paper in Long Island, which published these stories. If Newsday hadn't published it, because the Iraqis did such a bad job of representing themselves, you know, why didn't they go to, say, Le Monde or even... Um, you know, leftist papers, L'Humanité in France and tried to... No, they didn't bother. They just tried in New York, failed. The ambassador failed. They put it aside. Somebody leaked it to Newsday. That's how we found out about it. So this attitude that there are some rogue states or there is an axis of evil allows you to say, we don't need to negotiate with them. They are barbarians. And if they do put forward some kind of negotiating agreement on the table, we can completely forget about it. The record will forget about it. Nobody's going to write about it. After this conversation with Noam, I went back and looked at some of the standard texts on the lead up to the wars in Iraq, the two wars, lead up to the war in Afghanistan. I saw no mention in any of these texts of the peace um, entreaty that came from Baghdad and from Kabul, completely obliterated in the historical record. Indeed. And, and even after September 11th and after the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan, which started October 7th, uh, 2001, the, the Taliban were dispersed. The Taliban were basically defeated. They were fleeing. They were retreating wildly. And there was a backroom uh, offer to the U.S. by the Taliban basically to surrender in exchange for in exchange for amnesty, basically, that they wouldn't be imprisoned or killed, to which that same Donald Rumsfeld said, we don't negotiate with terrorists. Just keep that in mind, everybody, because here we are 20 years later, the Taliban is the government. The U.S. said, no, we won't negotiate even your own surrender. We won't even negotiate an unconditional surrender. We're not gonna talk to you because we don't have to. We're that bad, we're that big, we're that strong, and you are that weak. And here we are, 20 years later, 241,000 Afghans are dead from the 20-year occupation by NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. That's Afghanistan, not part of the North Atlantic. Uh, seven, you know, only about 2,000 Americans or a few thousand more contractors died, but 30,000 U.S. service members who served in Iraq or Afghanistan committed suicide. The number of people who killed themselves is a, the casualty rate's about four times higher. The U.S. spent several trillion dollars on the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And now under the pretext of helping girls, defending the rights of girls to go to school, the U.S. has seized control of the same assets that belong to Afghanistan, $9 billion. And so now the U.S. is essentially starving Afghan girls. And when I say starving, I'm not saying it hyperbolically. Girls are starving like their brothers are starving in Afghanistan. And, there, and the, the U.S. always uses 
a pretext. So you have pretextual explanations that pacify the public at home. You have this brute power that allows the policymakers to make big decisions, which are frequently very bad decisions. I mean, even bad for the empire. But the thing goes on and on and on. It doesn't, that's why I'm so glad you use the idea or the word, the language of fragility. The empire in decline doesn't mean the empire will go away. In fact, no capitalist system ends its own rule. The ruling class doesn't say, gee, we really messed things up. We're going to step back now. They have to be changed. They, they have to be gotten rid of. A new system has to be created by people. So they're not going to disappear, but there's a fragile nature of the power, but it's a, it's, a, it's a toxic fragility. It's a kind of fragility that unless we, the people, restrain it, it keeps using all of these pretexts to carry out hideous uh, acts and crimes against humanity, which are right at the top tier of crimes against humanity. These are not like the, the Nazi crimes were here and American war uh, crimes against humanity are down here. I mean, when you think about Vietnam, which you talked about with Noam, and he was a leading analyst there, maybe 4 million Vietnamese died. And I think you talk about in the book about how casualties are dealt with. There's a sort of a, a disinterest in how many people died in Vietnam. We care about how many Americans died, but we don't care about the Vietnamese or the Iraqis or the Afghans. We don't seem to care. When I say we, I mean, I'm talking about bourgeois society and its opinion molders. You know, uh, this is something that is, is very meaningful to Chomsky. And he keeps talking about how there is a kind of mismatch between the facts of the numbers of people that died in some of these U.S. wars and the way it is, those, those dead are remembered in the United States. So there have been a series of polls, small-scale polls, one at the University of Massachusetts where students were asked, how many people do you think died in Vietnam? And the Vietnamese numbers are enormously deflated. Um, you know, and you ask them about other wars, say U.S., casualties in, in World War II, the numbers are enormously inflated. There's a sense that a lot of U.S. troops died in World War II, but that very few Vietnamese died in Vietnam. Uh, almost no knowledge about the fact that the war never really ended in 1975 in Vietnam, because once you destroy with chemical weapons a precious agricultural land, the war effectively continues for generations because that land is no longer going to be, uh, you know, you can't grow food crops, at least there, let alone anything. You know, one has seen down the, what used to be called the Ho Chi Minh Trail, large areas of land, which are just, you know, fenced over and closed for, you know, maybe a hundred years more. I, I don't know. Uh, you know, it's still heavily polluted by the Agent Orange dropped on those parts of, of the world. There is a mismatch in public consciousness. There's a feeling that, well, once the United States withdraws from Afghanistan, the war is over. But as you said, um, Afghan money was held in, in New York banks by an Afghan government that was pliant to the United States. That's why they held the money in the U.S. banks. And after the Taliban came to power, that $9 billion was, was divided into two. The United States decided that half of that money, the money of the Afghan people who were not responsible for 9-11, Half of that money was going to pay the survivors uh, and the victims of 9-11, the family members and so on. The other half was going to be held by the United States government who will decide where that money should go. You're quite right. 90% of the people of Afghanistan, according to UN numbers, are suffering from extreme poverty. Starvation, of course, a great symptom of that extreme poverty. Um, but it gets worse than that in a way. Uh, there is an assumption that until the Taliban came into power, things were okay in Afghanistan. You know, Brian, I went and interviewed people in the education ministry in Kabul before the U.S. government collapsed. I asked them a simple question. You know, all the data keeps coming in from the education ministry of how they have improved education in all the provinces in Afghanistan. And I asked them, how is that possible? Because U.S. military says that effectively... The Afghan National Army, the government of Kabul, um, and the U.S. troops only hold four or five principal districts. So how is, how is the education ministry able to function in other parts of the country? And the, what I heard from them was remarkable, Brian. And I'm surprised this was not the front page of the New York Times. 
what they said was they calculate numbers of students not based of the actual head counts of the students but of the number of chairs that the schools have that based on how many chairs are imported into afghanistan often um, through contracts given by the us government often contracts held by us contractors the number of chairs define the number of students in a classroom you can already see this is absurd particularly when i discovered from other people that a lot of these chairs were sitting in warehouses next to kabul airport they hadn't even been sent to the districts so there's a false understanding that before the taliban took over there was a lot of girls education and all of this has collapsed as a consequence of the taliban takeover in fact there wasn't great education taking place during um the high point of the us occupation it was just not possible to do it why not face up to that i mean a country has to fight its own battles of social development you can't come in there with guns and tell people you have to do this at least not in this way and this is a good reminder of why the us got involved in afghanistan in the first place not in 2001 but in the 1970s after the communists took over in afghanistan in 1978 one of the first things they did was to send out some of their best cadre university students from kabul from kandahar from jalalabad and and even mazar e sharif these students were sent out into the countryside in a massive literacy campaign and you know the first uh, indication of the mujahideen the us backed forces in afghanistan against um, the government in kabul the communist government at the time the first indication was the assassinations of these teachers in different districts look how the world moves you know these people in the 70s tried to improve literacy against the resistance of the landowners they were thwarted then eventually when the us government comes back they buy chairs and the chairs stand in for students and now you don't even have these chairs indeed indeed very very important information thousands of those teachers were assassinated at that time thousands and the communist uh government that took power in 1978 in afghanistan when you look at its political program it was education for girls minimum wage land reform the right to unionize in essence really what would be called in marxist language a, a bourgeois democratic program minimum program to help afghanistan develop and at that time the mujahideen so called and it became an international movement and osama bin laden who later forms al qaeda was a principal fundraiser and spokesperson and that at that time at that time the united states was on the side of osama bin laden on the side of the mujahideen people have to really know this that at that time the united states was supporting the forces who developed or devolved or evolved into al qaeda and eventually the taliban but because they were fighting socialists they were the good extremist elements because they were fighting socialism it was fine that they were going to kill teachers who dared to try to teach girls to read in the countryside and one of the interesting parts of the book uh and your, the conversation that you're having with Noam Chomsky is uh how that period in the late 1970s and early and mid 1980s is remembered by Afghans who actually care about the rights of women and the rights of girls and the rights of education and Noam Chomsky was no you know sort of uh camp follower of the Soviet Union far from it uh he wouldn't describe himself as pro soviet i don't think at any time uh but in his objectivity which is revealed in your book in your conversations with him noam chomsky's talking about how the people who actually know what's going on in kabul say in the early 1980s and comparing it to now or to later think of that period the period of the so-called soviet occupation as a golden era that's all in this book well it's really interesting that on several occasions of our conversation noam came to the point that during the us occupation um a distinguished high official of the british government wrote in the financial times 
that when he went into the bazaars in Kabul, in Kabul, which was the heart of the U.S. occupation, there were posters with a picture of Muhammad Najibullah. Now, who was Muhammad Najibullah? Muhammad Najibullah was the last communist president of Afghanistan who was brutally killed by the Taliban. They dragged him out of a, the UN office in Kabul, hung him to a lamppost, let his body sit there and so on. By the way, it's with great pleasure that one of the blurbs at the back of the book is written by Muhammad Najibullah's daughter, Hila Najibullah, um, a very uh, good political scientist herself. Uh, who, you know, continues to sort of hold up uh, the importance of her father's role in the declining years of the People's Democratic, um, you know, government in, in, in Afghanistan. But you see, you're right. I mean, Noam Chomsky has definitely never said I'm a, a camp follower, as you put it, of the Soviet Union. But he's driven by the facts. And what do the facts show him? Well, until he met Rasil Basu, a very important UN official, um, you know, a woman who had been stationed in Baghdad uh, during the declining years of um, of the uh, the communist government, and then during the period of the the Mujahideen, uh, Rasil Basu had seen all this with her own eyes, and she reported to Chomsky that this is what I saw. But what's striking, and we mentioned this in the book is that in the lead up to the invasion of Afghanistan in 2001, no periodical in the United States, neither the major newspapers, the New York Times, but not even Ms. Magazine, the leading American feminist periodical, would carry an article written by Rasil Basu about what she had herself experienced as a high official of the United Nations in Afghanistan about girls' education during the communist government. By the way, eventually she did publish that article, but not in the United States. It was published in Asia Times, which is based in Bangkok, read widely in Asia, but not read that much in the United States. Um, Chomsky is a person who basically follows the facts. And when you look at the facts here, you look at the fact that somebody like Rasil Basu is saying, look, there's this issue of girls' education during the communist rule. But then more than anything else, when a conservative British official says that one of the most highly respected figures in Kabul uh, is Muhammad Najibullah, it should give one pause. Uh, Najibullah much more, um, you know, uh, much more beloved than Hamid Karzai, uh, somebody who is supposed to have helped liberate Afghanistan from the Taliban. Now, a country like Afghanistan doesn't deserve the Taliban. I, I don't agree with that opinion, you know, that this is some sort of medieval country and that's where the people are at. It just happens that the Taliban right now, the principal political force in the country, other political forces will arise. The contradictions of Afghanistan will generate its own uh, internal political oppositions as it is already um, pr producing. There are protests taking place around the country. Let's see how it develops. But I very much caution people from the belief that only a NATO intervention or only a U.S. intervention or only the United States squeezing Afghanistan is going to get rid of the Taliban. We've been through that before over and over again. Countries have to develop their own resistance uh, against the kind of, you know, ghastly political forces that exist there. They don't really need, um, you know, planes to come and bomb their adversaries. What they need is solidarity. That's different. Solidarity is an acceptable form of internationalism. But bombing, war, that's not internationalism. That's precisely its opposite. I was just recently on a, a, a television panel about the 20th anniversary or 21st anniversary of the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan. And it was really an interesting panel. It was people from... South Asia, people from China, myself uh, from the United States. But what I found most interesting about it was a short video that was made by someone who was on the panel who had been a U.S. diplomat and uh, in, in Afghanistan. And he went around and he was interviewing people one year after the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. And he said what everybody talked about 
everybody talked about was now there was security, like there was peace, like there was there was this very positive outcome a year later that people weren't hearing drones in the skies. They weren't thinking there was about to be a battle. I mean, the idea of just living in peace uh, for those of us who live, say, in the United States, who, you know, our country hasn't been directly immersed in a war since, you know, the Civil War on our own soil, you, you kind of don't know what that's about. You don't, you know, it's all a, a bit of an abstraction. But people were really happy, including people who he was talking to who were enemies of the Taliban. They were just happy that bombs were not falling after 20 years of war, after so many dead. But they were also talking about, and he interviewed a number of low-income folks who were surviving five years ago, they can't survive. They literally can't survive. There was, and this reminded me so much of what happened in Iraq because I went to Iraq a lot. I went right before the first Gulf War. I took Muhammad Ali and an entourage of his friends. We tried to stop the war. We organized demonstrations. And later I went to Iraq and was bringing medicine as part of an international civil disobedience against the economic sanctions, which are just a form of slow motion genocide against poor people. And it reminded me so much because we went from emergency room to emergency room in Baghdad hospitals, talking to moms while their little shriveled babies were literally dying as we spoke to them because they didn't have medicine for treatable problems like like diarrhea that they got from bad drinking water. That's what's happening now in Afghanistan. So all the people who talk about we, we, we have to punish the Taliban because we care about girls and girls' rights, and of course we should, and we should fight against the reactionary policies of the Taliban, but strangulating the, the economy economically, that's another part of this book that I think is so important, is that it's not only a critique of U.S. foreign policy, but sort of the humanism of, of Chomsky, his concern about those who are the targets, the victims of American imperialism, that comes through. And I think this is an important part of the battle of ideas, an important part of movement building in the United States, is to not treat this as some sort of abstraction. You can say, oh, they're Afghans, they're not us. But they are us. I mean, we're all part of the same human family. And that's one of the elements of Chomsky's sort of cutting analysis that I think also is so important for the movement to share. You know, um, what, what you say is very true because um, it's very painful to hear people basically bring us back to the era of when collective punishment was acceptable, Brian, which is now illegal. Uh, thanks to the Geneva Conventions. It's illegal to actually impose collective punishment against a population. We are hearing now from uh, elected officials in the UK, in the US, about how sanctions against Russia must hurt the Russian people. Uh, those statements themselves are illegal, according to the Geneva Convention. The sanctions against Iran must hurt the Iranian people. That's an illegal statement to make because the Geneva Conventions prevents collective punishment. Um, it seems that people are just inured to the fact that the Afghans must have collective punishment against them. This theft of this $9 billion is effectively a form of collective punishment against the Afghan people. Uh, and it's outrageous. It, it should not be allowed. Look, the Taliban have twice benefited from the argument that at least we have security. Once in 96, don't forget that the war between the Mujahideen and the Soviets Mujahideen backed fully by the U.S., the Saudis, the Pakistanis, and so on. That war was not as bloody as the civil war amongst the Mujahideen from about 1992 to 1996. That was far bloodier. Um, Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, leading one faction uh, of the Jamaat-e-Islami, essentially fired rockets directly into Kabul, you know, devastating civilian neighborhoods. The Taliban came to power in 96. Yes, they were brutal. They murdered Najibullah in cold blood. But having taken power, people said, well, thank God the civil war is over. So they've twice benefited from this. You know, now people say, thank God this is over. But you're quite right. The contradictions in Afghanistan are going to generate a politics. I mean, the Afghan people are up to it, you know, up to the task of generating their own resistance in their own small, different ways. You know, they, they, there's already women on the streets calling for women's education. We've already seen old trade unionists, people that I've known for years, 
are going on to the streets talking about the cost of living and so on they're going to generate their own critique and by the way what you said about chomsky i want to point out something he mentioned to me during the point the high point of the us war on vietnam the united states actually bombed um the university in hanoi so most of the buildings had been destroyed and the faculty members in vietnam at least in the northern part felt completely cut off from all the educational trends around the world they didn't know what was being published in their various fields now one of the amazing things about a person like noam chomsky is he happens to know everything uh, about a lot of things including you know the latest in biology and so on he reads widely so when he was in hanoi in 1969 professors came up to him and said mr chomsky at the time he was a very young man they said would you give a series of lectures for a whole week you know basically all through the day on a range of subjects just like just basically download your brain to us we want to know what's happening in the rest of the world it's a very interesting moment in both the uh, the struggle in vietnam and in chomsky's visit there so he spent the whole week just giving public lectures in bombed out buildings all kinds of places what did he talk about he talked about of course you know latest developments in linguistics latest latest writings in political science but he also talked about norman mailer's recent book which he had just read and what was going on on us television you know he talked about a range of issues why because the vietnamese are people uh, because he understood that even at a time of great war they want they were curious to build their knowledge their capacity to be humans in the world that everything about being in vietnam wasn't to see which was what area was bombed and you know how are people no it was also what what happens tomorrow because after all the war is going to end at some point and these professors are going to get back to teaching at some point they are human beings the capacity to see your country's adversary as a human being that is the capacity that we need to inculcate among young people around the world young people in the united states in particular need to see the afghan people as much more than victims of a terrible recent history they are people who are interested in a range of issues if a young person in the united states wants to do say a zoom class for people in afghanistan in kabul on you know some issue or the other how interesting to make that step to connect even with you know middle class children in kabul who have access to some computers and so on even that gesture brian that is a profound gesture of humanization uh, not only for the people in in afghanistan but in the united states and if if we if you and i want to take a a group of people to kabul and we can go and lecture in kabul university how interesting let's see if the taliban would allow us brian to teach a one week course on marxism inside um in kabul university all right vj as we go out i want to i want to ask to have the the copy of the book the cover of the book come back up on our screen if possible because uh the reason we're talking is not only because you're a fascinating person and you're traveling around the world and you're engaged in struggle and you're launching uh tricontinental research uh the tricontinental institute and involved in so many endeavors uh but also because we want people to read this book this is a good book for those who are still wanting to learn even basic information it's accessible it's comprehensive the fact that it talks about Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia the wars of 50 and 60 years ago but then updates it with the two Iraq wars the Libya conflict uh and other conflicts Afghanistan of course uh that makes it you know cover as a survey sort of a recent important part of US history but it also gives us a political perspective it gives us the perspective that it's a it's an empire a fragile empire an empire that won't die on its own uh, an empire whose greatest weakness its greatest vulnerability if there if one is looking for vulnerabilities is not in ukraine or afghanistan or in iraq but right here in the united states where people who care people who are also suffering are together fighting for justice and for radical transformation vj prashad thank you so much for joining the socialist program Thanks a lot Brian